Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer for Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining today's Dataversity webinar, Conceptual versus Logical versus Physical Data Modeling. It is the latest installment in a monthly series called Data Ed Online with Dr. Peter Aiken. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we'll be collecting them by the Q&A section. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, the Zoom chat default to send to just the panelists, but you can absolutely switch that to network with everyone. To open the Q&A or the chat panel, you may find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen for those features. And to answer the most commonly asked questions, as always, we will send a follow-up email to all registrants within two business days containing links to the slides. And yes, we are recording and will likewise send a link of the recording to the session, as well as any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Dr. Peter Aiken. Peter is an acknowledged data management authority and associate professor at Virginia Commonwealth University, president of DEMA International, and associate director of the MIT International Society of Chief Data Officers. For more than 35 years, Peter has learned from working with hundreds of data management practices in 30 countries, including some of the world's most important. Among his 12 books are many first, starting before Google, before data was big, and before data science, Peter has founded several organizations that help more than 200 organizations leverage data specific savings, which have been measured at more than 1.5 billion US dollars. His latest project is anything awesome. And with that, let me turn everything over to Peter to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Oh, you're muted, Peter. Sorry about that. Oh, you're still muted. There we go. Ah, perfect. Now we can oh, hear my you. My apologies. Uh, <laughs> what a great welcome, and I blew it entirely by having my new microphone cluster not ready and where to go. But uh, it's welcome to everybody today. And uh, yes, the topic is conceptual versus logical versus physical data modeling. And just briefly, what we're going to cover is an introduction to modeling data in general, because it is uh, contextually relevant to what we're doing. We'll talk specifically about conceptual, logical, and physical modeling activities. Uh, they should all be seen, though, moreover, as a transition from one to another. And the main way of understanding that transition is this thing I call the washing machine diagram that's located to the right uh, here. You can see as is and to be on it. We'll go through that in more depth as we get started uh, around this. In fact, let's uh, go ahead and just jump right in and start talking about this, which is really an interesting topic. And I had three of my dear colleagues reach out to me, uh, David Hay, who uh, has a wonderful book on the topic here and a, a YouTube that he'd love you to get to listen to as well, uh, Dr. Bernard Talheim, uh, who's done some of the really fine academic work on this. And these are just a couple of papers that he's done that you might find relevant out there. And our dear friend, uh, Gordon Everst, and uh, he has a, a take on this. All three of these gentlemen reached out to me in, in advance of talking about this topic uh, and wanted to make sure they got their uh, perspectives in. It was absolutely delightful talking to everybody. What we're all collectively concerned about is that there's just an immense amount of data being created. And I could read these individually back to you, but just understand that it's increasing at an increasing rate. And it is useful to sort of get an idea that most of the data that we're working with was only created in the last two years. And that represents an amazing context for us because data is growing like this and our analysis capabilities are simply not even close to keeping up on this. We do have some measurements that they love to throw up, but it's still pretty bad news all the way around uh, on this that if we want to do better, and this is, of course, assuming that the data is in really good shape. Uh, unfortunately, most data is sort of a dumpster fire, uh, I won't say all, but uh, certainly much more than we'd like it to be. And that not understanding what bad data looks like means we have lack of respect for understanding, in this case, architectures, which all organizations have, and could be a variety of different types. About one in 10 organizations actually tries to maintain one or more of these architectures. Uh, some of these are understood, which is good. Uh, again, you have to have the architecture if you exist, but if you don't understand it, if it's not documented, how can anybody understand it? Uh, it's going to be very problematic for you. And more importantly, the understanding has to be met by a shared group that 
is comprised of business users, also with the technical users, also with the systems users on this in order to make sure that we have full understanding all the way around <clears throat> of how all this works. Because uh, absent that, we create sand in the machinery at the absolute lowest level of the organization. And what we're talking about is very simple things, such as a common vocabulary. And the vocabulary, in this case, are going to be the nouns that are going to be attached to the models as we get to them uh, in, in context here. But the, the challenge is that most data is encumbered by some form of data debt. And you really have to undo some existing things to sort of get to a zero spot before you can try to go deeper into it. But these, these data challenges are vastly underestimated in most instances. Let's give a precise definition to data at this point in time. Uh, we may throw out the number 42, and if you happen to be a fan of Douglas Adams, you would know that the number 42 represents the meaning of life. And the rest of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, hold on tight. Number 42 also was the number on Jackie Robinson's jersey. And in fact, the number of the, excuse me, the title of the film about his life. So there's another meaning for the number fact 42 that's there. Uh, we'll go ahead and put a third one up because it's always good to do it in threes. And that's just the question of, is Peter allowed to buy alcoholic beverages in the Commonwealth of Virginia? Well, 42 was my age 24 years ago. So you can do the math and see that, in fact, I am eligible to drink alcoholic beverages. But of course, nobody should drink and drive uh, around that. Well, that little deviation there mainly took your mind to starting to think about 42 as a fact, but could be paired with different things to mean different uh, uh, activities and, and situations that are here. And only when the data is paired with a fact and a meaning does it become, in fact, meaningful. That is the definition of it. And we also have to find a subset of data that is more useful to us than everything, because everything, as we've already seen, is impossible to keep up on. Data becomes information when it's requested. And that form of requesting the data is the main thing that differentiates it because it's still going to come back and say 42 is the number of Jackie Robinson's jersey, uh, if that's the question that you ask. But now it has been transformed into information because somebody has asked for it. This gives a wonderful, you can have data without information, but you can't have information without the data. Again, it's why they should be managed together as opposed to separately and all sorts of other components that go on around that. We've just got one more stop on this particular little journey here. That's the idea of what is intelligence. And intelligence, oftentimes, it's been called knowledge or wisdom systems. Uh, but it's how is that information used in the organization? And those are the three ways we can objectively define this architecture here such that we're all on the same page. And these definitions, we've been using them, I ran across them in the Department of Defense back in the 1980s uh, around this. That thing that just bounced there was a data structure. That's an arrangement of data showing that, again, useful data is a combination of a fact and a meaning, and useful data, when it's provided in response to a request for that, it becomes information. And when it's used strategically, it then becomes intelligence. <laughs> Excuse me, so keep that in mind as a data structure, because there's a generalized data structure, customer sales order, sales order line product, a way of pinning down customers and trying tying them to products that have been purchased. And we can look at a, a good computer science definition that says, uh, you know, a lot of uh, really important things. But what we're really talking about here are the rules for the grammar. What can customers do? Uh, are they unique? Is there a balance? Are they arranged in a certain way? The, the more important question on all of these, how many do we want? Just as structures. And the answer is, gosh, as few as possible. So if we ever have an option of creating something new or generally keeping what we have and perhaps uh, modifying it slightly as opposed to creating a new version, that should be our answer in today's data world. It's just a, a kind of crazy to operate otherwise. In fact, the numbers are so intense for some organizations, it becomes really problematic. If you look at this hypothetical situation of just six applications connecting each other, if everything was truly going to be connected to everything else, it would be 15 interfaces and the number of applications six times six minus one five divided by two gives us 15 on the top there. Well, that, that experience takes us a ways uh, on this. For example, with this number was given to me to use by the Royal Canadian Bank a number of years ago, where they said they had 200 major applications and about 5,000 interfaces between all of these. Let's just see how that works on a comparison basis. If we look 
you can see six going to 60, going to 600. Uh, we'll put their piece out there at 200 right there and, and 5,000. Uh, they're clearly better than average, and they still have a very large and complex situation uh, on their hands. So again, the, the fewer of these things that we have in an organization, that's got to be a stated objective goal in order to, to work towards this. Each of these models can be put on a framework. The first one I'm going to show you is as is represented by the little or icon toolkit uh, that's there uh, in the left hand side so we have three versions of as is i'll come back and tell you about them in a minute the other is to be that's what we'd like to have so we have existing in the brown and, and we'd like to have in the blue sky uh, version of that below but it's a three-dimensional model so we also need a dimension going back and that is whether the model has been validated or not validated and that's going to be true whether it's an as is or a to be model so you can now see we've got a, a space that's relatively defined we just have one more uh, row to put on it uh, the labels for that are conceptual logical or physical models so each of these models at the conceptual logical or physical level can be either as is or to be and if it hasn't been validated it is unvalidated uh, so we're going to keep that in mind again it's just sort of a uh, a way to think about it when we're doing as is and the way we've taught people in school to do this is that they build the requirements which are in some form of a loose leaf binder of some sort we then create them into a model to come up with our logical model on this and then get the actual physical implementation of the system as it's put together every modeling change that we make can be mapped to some transformation on this framework here and, and really that's the best way to think about them is what are we trying to get to what are the focuses, the goals of the specific modeling uh, that we're doing? And again, as I was saying before, most people start off with sort of a forward engineering. These are assuming validated models, uh, and they're they're simply building these. Now, there's a challenge associated with that, and that is that when you get to the real world, we spend 80% of our dollars in the real world making existing things better and fixing things that have gone wrong with our existing things. Uh, and there's only 20% of our dollars go into building new stuff uh, around that way and while we teach people how to do only that as part of school is just sort of crazy but uh, we really need to pay attention to is the aspect of reverse engineering taking the existing systems understanding them and as my friend Elliot Tchaikovsky wrote it a while back Elliot uh, evolved existing systems using a structured technique aimed at recovering rigorous knowledge of the existing system to leverage enhancement efforts and that's of course the key to it we want to go from physical as is to logical as is and logical as is to conceptual as is uh, in there if we need to change the requirements if we don't we can stop at the logical uh, how in fact the re-engineering process where most organizations are attempting to do right now, but are doing relatively poorly, is to reverse engineer the existing systems. After all, if you don't understand the existing systems' strengths and weaknesses, how are you going to avoid replicating the bad stuff? And and uh, how do you go about making sure that you create recreate the good stuff? Well, again, as I mentioned before, if you go to the requirements level and change actually the requirements, you have to reverse engineer it twice uh, in order to come up with that. The next part is to go from your uh, uh, existing as is requirements to to be requirements now you have been informed by this you use this information there's also another opportunity as i mentioned before which is just to go design to design if you're not changing the requirements it's perfectly acceptable to go straight there uh, then make sure of course everything syncs together and uh, put it in place so that you can get things rolling uh, on that this is the proper way to do it and yet what happens in most instances is that organizations forklift the data directly from the physical as is to the physical to be without a single thought about what goes on in the meanwhile and that is of course crucially harmful to most of our organizations this model i just turned on its side here if you will uh maps relatively speaking to the ANSI spark stuff and i've got the reference to the wikipedia article right there but you can see they both deal with the conceptual level and a physical level and the part they differ on is a logical level in between which we found in the data modeling community to be uh, quite useful uh, again depending on exactly what you're attempting to uh, come up with uh, in order to look at this the conceptual model again is focused on abstract requirements logical is considered to be a refinement but not necessarily an abstraction in, in many instances and uh, that's one of the things one of our contributors pointed out to, uh, uh, in their presentation and then the, the physical implementation how does it work in oracle or in aws cloud or whatever else it is you're doing 
uh, but you should be able to change that back end in a way that doesn't impact the users. Of course, we all have been through those pieces where we have been, in fact, been in fact impacted in a real negative way uh, around that. These are all mappable to John Zachman's framework uh, in this quadrant right here. If you look at the inventory and uh, process representations, the what and how columns uh, close up, uh, again, they map very nicely onto conceptual, logical, and physical implementations of those models. Another way to think about the utility of each of these is the way they build uh, bridges, interestingly enough. Uh, and this is, uh, I haven't been here to this one, but this is a favorite of mine in terms of the, what they've done here. The old bridge, uh, excuse me, the old way of going was that yellow line that I'm drawing for you right there. It took a, a lot longer and, and, and was problematic enough that they were willing to uh, strip this uh, area entirely and, and make it uh, a wonderful marvel of this. It was focused on improving commerce around there. The conceptual model in this case was at the entity level and provided a focus and scope uh, to the modeling effort. It was rarely maintained that once you get the original one out, you just want to make sure it looks close enough to the product. The logical then was really the plan to take the what in the conceptual and go to the how, the transition from logical, uh, from conceptual to physical in there. And this was the plan that's needed in almost all data modeling instances in order to do this. Generally, these are developed to the attribute level and understood as a, a third normal form model. Doesn't mean they're maintained that way uh, in order to do that. And they really need to be refined until it becomes close enough to a solution that you can purchase, maybe tailoring it as opposed to customizing it in today's environment. And, and really having a good understanding that the business characteristics that you're modeling are going to complement those that your business is trying to achieve uh, in the process of doing this. Uh, finally, uh, these are maintained by more organizations. The physical models, again, how are we actually going to build this, uh, are the blueprints for actually building any of these out. And they are absolutely used uh, on an ongoing basis uh, in order to do this. Now, I want to spend a, a second on this uh, quick animation here. I'll voice over it here real briefly just to let you see that they, they were putting this piece together where they were taking the bridge and actually just moving it out. You can see this is just together like this. And when they got the bridge together, then it became structurally intact. Only then, after they put the two pieces and actually connected them, was the building, the, the, in, uh, excuse me, the bridge in this case, stronger as a result of that connection than it would have been weaker uh, otherwise. And you may say to yourself, wow, that was pretty incredible. How did they do that? Well, they had one problem. They couldn't push sideways on any of the piers that were up there. This has become a very common way of building buildings. And they use this wonderful device here. Uh, they gave, whoops, sorry, I'm going to go back and do that again. Uh, you can get the, uh, the, the sense for what happened as these things came together and that they were stronger after getting together, very much like your databases will be stronger because they will be, have structural integrity as opposed to not uh, around that. Again, topic way beyond the, the where we're focusing on today uh, on this. The second part of this is really brilliant. How do you move these bridges so that they put only downward pressure on them? And the answer was you drag them up a slight incline. That was about two feet of lift that they got to the entire bridge. And they pulled it forward and then pulled the wedge out from underneath it and set it down directly on top without applying any side pressure to it whatsoever. Uh, just a really interesting way of doing this, and it has produced some really outstanding engineering uh, feats. This is just one of them in order to do that. They needed all three of these kinds of models to sell this bridge to the public in France so that they would pay for it uh, in order to do this. Well, let's get back to data on this. And within that same context of where we were selling the bridge conceptually, you might ask the question, how are components expressed as architectures? And the answer is that details are organized into larger chunks. And that's a pretty intricate process uh, on that. Then the larger components are organized into models. And the models, in this case, become our data models. But they also introduce physical dependencies in our data. You have to have a record of, the, of a customer before you can do any charges to the customer record. And then overall, those models are introduced into architectures, which now really focus strategically on purposefulness. So we're going to keep all three of those intricacy here where they're put together in a way. And here's a, a, a little 
thing that we've done up here, thing, club ID, club description, club status, sex to be assigned, reason, reservation, et cetera. Then they're organized into models. Uh, um, so we now take these collections of entities and organize them, and again, into purposefulness. Now, one of the questions people ask all the time is why are there no uh, really good examples of data models. There are actually, if you go out and look at the DOD data model uh, that we did more than 30 years ago, I believe at this point, uh, it's still in use uh, around DOD in various forms or another, but it's much complexity and it takes a long while to become used to them uh, on this. More importantly is to think about that stuff that I was showing you being a collection of stuff in a uh, data dictionary, a glossary, a vocabulary level, whatever you're going to call it uh, in this case. And that these data models, and the architecture as a result is developed in response to specific needs. So the organization understands a specific set of needs that they have to address from a data model perspective. This gets them at some specific information system requirements. Again, capture all that that we can in the trusted catalog, uh, whatever we're going to call it in there. And now you can see we go around and iterate on these, each one producing a slightly refined, evolving version of the product. Uh, in this case, the product is the data model at the center as we're learning how to use these. This is in order to avoid what we see too much in the industry, which is the, the situation of the princess on the P, as it's properly called from hence Christian Henderson Lewis. I circled the P at the bottom there, that green thing. And uh, there's the princess at the top who is sleepless as a result of having this imperfection in it. Now, it's not just as trivial in this case as the princess with ADHD, but uh, perhaps more along the lines of a serious defect in a product can haunt it through the entirety of its product. And there's several companies uh, that have had these kinds of oopsies as they've gone out. Because if you start out with a flawed data model, it locks in these imperfections for the life of the product. Uh, it restricts data investment benefits in the future, and it decreases the organization's ability to leverage. Consuming in the process of migrating, converting, and improving 20 to 40% of all IT budgets. Lack of all these things takes longer, costs more, delivers less, and presents greater value in this case. Let's get a couple of quick examples. Here's an example of a database for what used to be called iTunes, is now called the music in uh, the Apple and ecosystem over there. And if you look, I've purchased three rows of data. In this case, oh, each data is associated with a song, and there's the price on those pieces of data. So yay, I made a database, uh, great. Here's an interesting question though we like to ask, what information would be lost if we deleted record number one? And in this case, if we deleted record number one, uh, we lose the fact that Peter purchased We Met Today, as well as the fact that We Met Today costs 99 cents. That's two facts in one uh, row of data. That's usually unintended and undesirable uh, around that. And these are some simple tests that you can go through yourself uh, and take a look at various data designs as you're presented to them. Here's an, an insertion anomaly. Suppose I want to insert a new song named Scuba and it costs $1.29. I can't enter it into this database until I have an actual purchaser for it. So we can't insert a full row until we have an additional fact about that row. Again, undesirable, unintended. Uh, update anomalies. Suppose I'm going to change the price of we met today from 99 cents to $1.29. Uh, the process of going through and examining everything in song and changing all of them as well as a complex process. And of course, if there's any spelling errors in there, I'm going to miss them. They're not going to work either. Point of all this being that there are correct ways to have data organized, and it can be done for on the basis of flexibility, adaptability, retrievability, all sorts of things. And the, the bottom line when you get to all of it, and this is not a course in it, is, is that you're going to try to have uh, as little as possible one fact stored with one row of data. So uh, while that may be our original, our better set of doing it is to maintain a master set of tracks, records, songs, and that when I change the price for those songs, the price of that song is repopulated out to the entire database. And that there's a one-to-many relationship between each of the songs in the pricing database and each of the purchases that a purchaser has uh, on top of that. The problem is your IT workers don't know this, your knowledge workers don't know this, and it just becomes sand getting in the gears uh, in order to do this. Let's go into the conceptual modeling here. Again, this is the pink chartreuse, if you will, uh, level that's up there. It still has validated and unvalidated and has is and to be as well. 
uh, in order to take a look at it. The goal of a conceptualized data modeling effort is to harmonize standard vocabulary. Again, I mentioned the three-way uh, that we had to put together before in order to get it to work, focusing on strategic issues uh, that are there and not on details, really on how is this new system going to help us achieve organizational strategy in a more satisfying way. Um, we shouldn't have an unvalidated data model that just doesn't make sense. Would you want the word draft on, on your strategy for the organization? Uh, I think most organizations would pass on that uh, option. So helps organize the, the, the data concepts, give us some ideas as to what the relationship of data things ought to be uh, around there documenting these in such a way and, and trying to figure out our first version of these system-wide definitions as we go through the entire process. Um, also, we're likely to get a somewhat of an idea of what a high-level process interaction would look like given that uh, type of an interaction with the organization. All discussions of architecture are going to involve at least faster, better, and cheaper. And my good friend, Michael Adams, used to have this on the back of his business card. He said, we offer three kinds of services. You get to pick any two of them. Yes, what a wonderful thing. Uh, again, good reason for not trying to do too much uh, around this, but it's a tried and true method in terms of that. And if everybody says they can get you all three at once, uh, they can probably sell you the Brooklyn Bridge uh, as well. So let's look at why we need to focus this. And the, the real key, of course, is strategy. Uh, we didn't use the word a whole lot until about 1950 when the business people discovered it and discovered you could sell people 100 PowerPoint slides or a 100, 100 page report for lots of money. This really made strategy into a thing. Uh, again, where is the strategy? I want to look it up. Well, that's not how it's used, how it was originally used in the military. The definition is a pattern in a stream of decisions. And this is much more of a process than it is a thing in order to do this. Uh, Walmart's, through quick examples, Walmart's former strategy was everyday low price. You knew this, Walmart knew you knew this. The entire flight crew going to Walmart, uh, Bentonville Airport uh, uh, understands this. It's cemented into everybody's head. Everyday low price is exactly what Walmart was about for many, many years. And it was a very successful implementation of their strategy. Example number two, Wayne Gretzky in soccer. Wayne Gretzky's definition of strategy is he skates to where he thinks the puck will be. After all, if you're playing a game where you're chasing around a solid uh, little rubber ball there and it travels much faster than human beings do, you want to be where the puck is going to be as opposed to chasing the puck or you will never succeed in this particular game. Lots more of it at the Wikipedia entry on Wayne Gretzky's uh, entry at uh, Wikipedia's uh, site up there. Uh, one last example here, Napoleon facing a larger army. Napoleon is in blue, the British facing him, and the Prussian in uh, red for the British, black for the Prussians are facing him, and uh, Napoleon doesn't know exactly how to get out of it. The answer is, of course, divide and conquer. You're looking for a pattern in a stream of decisions uh, around that. Well, let's review that last one real quick. First of all, the key is to hit both armies in exactly the right spot so that they'll break apart. Uh, then we're going to have everybody turn to the right and defeat the Prussians, and then turn to the left and defeat the British. Uh, and oh, by the way, can you do this, please, uh, while somebody is shooting at you? Uh, it's uh, not an easy task. Argue that it's a complex strategy. And of course, if you know anything about history, you know that it, in fact, did not work uh, for Napoleon around this. So strategy has to be simple. Here's even a simple strategy that didn't work for an organization that I used to work for many, many moons ago that was trying to gain additional efficiencies around this. But by making a manager and a salesperson different types of people, uh, they weren't able to capture data about them and they were unable to gain efficiencies during a time when many other organizations were able to gain from those efficiencies. Other uses of strategic data models include the Sabre uh, creation of the flight booking process, AT&T inventing a new credit card business literally overnight, Amazon selling satisfaction or, or uh, um, uh, overnight uh, 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 delivery, uh, Amazon, uh, sorry, Capital One reinventing solicitation uh, around all these. Each of these are very much database centric uh, copies and the, the actual data that they used at the center of this was considered to be organizational property at the highest level of security, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
So let's again change topics slightly and just talk about uh, the process of data modeling. And what you probably want to start with is the idea of identifying entities, big blocks of person, places, or things about which you're going to create, read, update, or delete information uh, about. Then you want to identify a key for each of the entities. How am I going to identify a unique instance of that? How am I going to find out this Peter Aiken versus the one that's a uh, lawyer in Florida versus the one that is a uh, rock concert promoter in Ireland? And after we've identified the key, we draw a rough map of it back and forth to connect the various relationships that are there. Uh, then we identify the data attributes and parcel them out among the various uh, uh, entities that we're taking a look at. It's perfectly okay. In fact, it'd be surprising if it didn't, your model didn't evolve slightly at first. Uh, if it's still modeling or evolving or radically changing, um, you're not focusing in on a solution. And that's, of course, one of the measures of this that you want to take a look at. Uh, in order to do so. You should discover new things in your data model incrementally, and they should fall off into diminishing returns platform. Here's a, a very specific model that we did. This is a logical model comprising five model views from the taxpayer client, governance, program delivery, and vendor view for our State Department of Social Services. Uh, it was a number of years ago, but still uh, reasonably cogent on this. So you can see here that the taxpayer view had information on payments, taxpayers, benefits, social service programs, and that the uh, uh, client view uh, had information on payments. Whoops, sorry, I'm going to go back. Payments, clients, client benefits, and welfare agencies. In other words, each of these was focused in on that point that was of most interest to them. Governance, gosh, surprising, was most complicated uh, in that context uh, around this. Uh, then a program delivery view. These are what our partners are going to see. So each of these represent perspectives on the organization. And, and the logical model is a great way to show how they all fit together uh, in that type of a context, uh, looking at this. Uh, finally, the vendor view, which is where do I get paid? Uh, you know, and all that. And it, of course, sums up to a very nice view of it. Uh, I mentioned before this is glossary. Uh, it's the start of your enterprise taxonomy. It defines the initial entities for the conceptual data model. It engages the business community on providing terms. And I want to tell a, a very specific story about a use of a business glossary that I'm quite proud to have, have, have observed and learned from over the years. It has to do with Nokia. Uh, Pre-Microsoft acquisition, they were a tremendously gifted company. They had gone from tires and rubbers to consumer electronics phones uh, on this. And it, when I approached them at the phone stage, uh, Finns are bilingual because 2% of their population speaks Swedish and they don't want to be impolite uh, to that 2%. Nokia also wanted to play internationally on the uh, stock exchange and elsewhere and mandated the use of business in all business settings. So fortunately for me, who didn't speak Finnish or Swedish, uh, when I went to the meetings, they spoke them in uh, English. Lots of these words were unknown. And outside of data modeling entirely, they first of all made it culturally bad not to ask questions. So when the word came up that they didn't know, they would look at each other. And if there were two people that said, yes, we don't know what this means, they would build a common vocabulary. They would literally reach for their notebooks in there to see if there was a golden version of the term in the Nokia term bank. If not, a quick vote by the work group would decide whether to include it in the Nokia term bank. <laughs> it would not be automatically included. It went to a filtering group that uh, weekly reviewed the submissions and put out a new version. The new versions were, by the way, published as a single web page, and the only access mechanism was getting access to the web page and then using the search function of the web page to search. This is about as inexpensive as you can come up with uh, on all of this. Again, Nokia term bank. Wonderful experience. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we were curious. We were taking pictures of this thing that was in many of the offices. We asked questions about it. And they said, oh, that's our cruiser collector. And we said, what is that? And they handed us a 50-page document that described much more in detail than they had about any of the data models that, of course, we were there to discuss uh, around with them. Remember, this is the environment that we're working in. First, we're reverse engineering something of an existing system, and then we're going to understand that information as part of the existing, excuse me, the 2B design. And only when we use that design are we going to be using it next uh, in order to do that. Let's look at our, our next chunk then, the logical models that are here. Again, this is the middle, the orange row. They can be validated or not validated. They can be as is or to be. Remember, every single one 
of your mappings goes into one of those. So if you don't understand where you are and where you're trying to get to, you probably don't have a good enough focused session around this. Again, from a logical perspective, you now start to talk about size and shape. Where's the data going to come from? What are the functions? The downstream uses uh, gives us the ability to do this free from technology considerations. Of course, we know it's going to go in the cloud until the cloud continues to get hacked, and then it'll all come back on prem. But you know that's just the way it goes. I'm um, going to start to document some original uh, and, and preliminary data designs that show how we're satisfying specific business objectives. So the as is, they're going to challenge the conceptual model. Uh, you may come up with a difference, which is great. Uh, it shows refined thinking in most cases. Uh, explicitly incorporate relevant components, starting to incorporate your as is stuff. The two Bs are going to be the principle around what new systems are built, using that common vocabulary uh, in order to do this. Now, most of the time, people will tell you when you're doing your modeling to use a definition. Uh, so here's a definition of a bed, something that you would sleep in. I was taught by uh, Clive to do it much more focused, which is to come up with a purpose statement. Uh, here we have one called bed. It's a data asset type. It's a principal data asset type. So there's a hospital bed up in the right-hand corner to give you a conceptual uh, thing of what's going on there. It describes why is the information maintaining. In other words, why are we maintaining information about beds? Now, Interestingly, it was that second clause there. It contains information about beds within rooms that proved to be interesting on us. So we've had a source, interestingly. We have some attributes that we're using to describe it uh, on there. And we have some associations, and this is where it got to be very interesting. One room can contain zero or many beds. How are you going to tell? Well, in this time, you're going to put a uh, tracking device on each of the beds, and the beds were going to tell us where the patients were being lost. Uh, luckily, it was only in a draft form because uh, we were able to show them that they had neglected to understand what is the nature of the room uh, of a hallway or an elevator, both of which uh, broke their model. And uh, how uh, is it going to be the case that uh, we're going to maintain this information tracking uh, once we get outside of the uh, the hospital itself uh, so for outpatient services and things like this. Again, just minor things, but it was a, we were able to go through and, and focus in there. So fix that piece, validate the model, uh, move on. Here's another question that you want to ask at your logical level. You've got beds and rooms. Great. There's a relationship between them. What should it be? A bed's related to a room. Nice tempt, but not good enough. Let's go a little bit deeper. Um, here we go. Many beds are related to many rooms. Well, that's a, a tough information solution problem. Uh, if you look at it carefully, you'll figure out why. And here's the final solution in this case for this particular instance, which is that one room can contain zero, one or more beds in each room. That third requirement now gives you the most precise focus on it. You will get very different systems out of very different people, depending on which of those three requirements are instance. What if beds can be moved about the rooms, right? And now we have uh, other things that pop into place. These are the five uh, cardinality options that are, are uh, postulated across these. Again, you can have exactly one, one or many, eventually one. Again, it's a nuance of data modeling, probably for a more advanced topic, but you're saying you're adding the element of time to it, saying that you'd like to have uh, in there. Same thing, zero, one or many uh, optionals uh, coming out along those. Each of these is going to give you a different way to look at it. Let's look at it in a, a specific example here. Again, this is our uh, room and patient and bed uh, situation. And recall, uh, in this case, uh, we've got a, a one-to-many relationship uh, between room and bed and a one-to-many, as many to many relationship between patients and beds. Uh, so a bed is placed in one and only one room and a room contains zero or more beds. Uh, in this case, a bed is occupied by zero or more patients and a patient occupies one or more beds. Uh, don't ask too many questions on that. It gets uh, sticky really quickly. Uh, this gives us the ability to come up with these conceptual data models that may be like some of the information on this page here where you're simply looking at what is the relationship between an employee and a sales rep uh, and all the rest of these. And you can see there's some one-to-many and one-to-one -one and other types of things. There's lots of notions. Most people use what's called information engineering, and, and really it's a matter of picking it uh, to do. Here's another uh, example of a work product that comes out of uh, one of these exercises. One of the groups may come up with a representation describing the relationship formally between account subscriber charge and bill uh, in this case. And you can see it's formally tapped out. And the knowledge worker of the organization say, 
uh, this is the way we will speak about these things in the future, giving us, again, the ability to focus in on this type of an activity, uh, making it just really, really easy to get on the same page and eliminating in the process often hundreds and hundreds of, of tiny, tiny cuts that are, are uh, sort of stabbing in organizations because they do a bad job at this. So again, just remember we're, we're reverse engineering, we're using that information in the design of the new system and we're creating it. And our data model is one way of transferring some information between these various stages uh, as you're trying to move things uh, around the organization. Uh, lastly, again, our, our topic here, move physical. Uh, so again, this is uh, the, uh, the bottom end, if you will, of the, uh, uh, the scale here, again, we have certainly as is and to be, and we have validated and non-validated. And those terms become much more important uh, in this type of modeling because you're looking at evidence-based type of information. These activities are more related to archaeology than they are necessarily between uh, creativity. Uh, some very interesting books. We can talk about that at the end there, give us some ideas. But the idea is to, to look at and to be able to recreate what are the actual data structures that are used in the various data flow diagrams and entity relationship diagrams throughout the organization to continue to populate the dictionary, glossary, catalog, whatever we're going to call it uh, together so that we have these. And there should be a one-to-one -one component uh, uh, verification between the components in the physical as-is system and the physical as-is model. Um, Another question is why would anybody be hand making DDL with today's tool capabilities? They are so powerful that uh, it's a matter of regenerating rather than trying to correct uh, DDL. They um, had to have that in order to put the system into production as well. Remember that business is going from the what to the how. Uh, very critical on there because these do become the blueprints for the solution that need to be maintained in order to, to keep these things. Uh, there's some interesting aspects from physical perspective. Again, they should be the foundational system. One of the, the tricks that uh, people use when they're testing this is they'll walk into an organization and have a stopwatch and see how long it takes to produce the actual results uh, that are requested there. Sometimes it's, it's very close to seconds and sometimes it's very close to months uh, in order to do that. Uh, how do we go about accessing the data that's actually in the system? Uh, we can oftentimes apply semi-automatic uh, reverse engineering techniques to this. Uh, and again, my first book was on that uh, very subject for the uh, U.S. military uh, in order to do that. Um, again, taking a look at the specifications for accessing the data, the application, what are the current and future data elements that are maintained by this? And again, these things can be maintained semi-automatically uh, in a way. So the data is going to be persons, places, or things that need to be uh, created, read, updated, or deleted. Some people add the word archived onto that. Uh, in order to come up with a CRUD A model or a CRUD model. These are attributes, uh, they are characteristics of the various things that we have in each area. Here's an example. We're looking at attributes and relationships. We can talk about clubs and regions. So here's a region uh, entity with a club ID as a primary key. Uh, here's another one with a club reporting with a club ID, and you can see that's the common key between the two. Again, notice the crow's feed one region has many clubs reporting to it, but a club does not report to multiple regions. Other attributes of interest include name and weather. And what does this tell us right away? Well, it says clubs need to be identified separately from one another. Not sure particularly why, but that's clearly a business requirement. And that club-specific information is likely maintained as part of this uh, description around here. Uh, that some level of organization exists above the club level, which is again, this region concept. You can see by filling out some additional parts of this, each club must be part of a region as a business rule that is implemented by this particular data model. If you don't get this right, it's very difficult to change in production and almost impossible to change in software. Uh, we look around the uses, an organization may decide to characterize parts of things in a way I've got set up there on the, the right. And that, whether it has these tables that are allowed. So all clubs can have a status. Many reasons can be assigned to a reservation. Uh, ID permits every club to be distinct from every other club and description is likely to be unique for every particular club. So this gives us the idea that we can use this. The, the model variances are really 
focusing in on trying to make sure we have as many things in common as we can. Because if we have too many of those data structures, we're going to spend all our time transforming between data structures. If you think I'm kidding, I've seen it uh, that's out there. Uh, again, what are the data things for? What do they do? How do they interact? We need to understand this because data, remember, is going to become the most valuable thing of our assets going forward. It maps critical business needs. It contains essential data to the data consumers, functioning as a kind of sheet music. Uh, again, good set of musicians that are all able to read music are going to ask for the sheet music before uh, they start to sing, uh, just knowing that things go better if you're singing off the same sheet of music and that the metadata is essential to other business functions. The process is iterative and may include logical, physical, and conceptual models as you're trying to figure out. But once the modeling is done, make sure that you're trying to achieve a specific goal and not just doing it for modeling sake. Now, these are the five basic structures that you'll find at the heart of most production data. Uh, a, a flat file, a um, index sequential file, a network database, a hierarchical database, and a relational database, and then there's everything else. And the everything else is it really doesn't have much to tell you about. It's usually a predefined or everything's index kind of thing. Nothing wrong with any of them, but you're still going to come down to one of these. It's important to be somewhat familiar with them because these outperform the other types of databases in terms of production function. So almost what happens almost always is that you make your breakthrough in the things that are listed in purple there, and then you transform it into something that will be productionable uh, so that you don't end up running into a, a, a cliff uh, given that situation. Here's a, an easy one to understand just from an architecture perspective. Again, you guys know that I'm a university professor at VCU, and we had something originally here called a student database master, and that that's file, the parent-child uh, relationship between that and each of the other components, even though you can't read them, and please don't try, I'm not trying to break your eyes, uh, but showing that one parent is related to many children in there, and that this was the way in which this data was organized and ran for the university context for many, many years. Uh, perfectly fine instead of uh, uh, tasks in order to do this. We were propositioned at one point with a alternative, and we said, please send us a model, and they sent us this. And uh, we just had to laugh because there's absolutely no correspondence between these two models uh, in terms of showing what one will do. The more important part was that while we certainly knew this was the physical as is model that we did, uh, took that out of a, a class of students actually that did that. Uh, the, this was, they couldn't even tell us, was it a data model, a conceptual model, a logical model, a physical model? Uh, again, we couldn't read anything on there as you can't either. And it was, uh, just a very unsatisfactory time. But if they can't explain this to you and you know, answer the simple question, like, is this a logical, physical, or conceptual model? And does it represent as isn't too bad to be? And has it been validated? That's going to be a problem uh, here. The differences between model uh, levels are not necessarily a one is a decomposition of the other, just the same way as on the framework. It doesn't work that way, but that there are differences. Here's a conceptual model for HR. Again, we're not going to go through this. I'm leaving this as reference material for you to come back and look at, because of course you know we're recording this, but it gives you some information conceptually about what HR is going to take care of and a logical model, which turns out to be actually simpler than that. Uh, in there and a physical model overview. And we're going to have to look at the details. There's the physical piece, part one of four, part two of four, part three of four, and part four of four. And you may say to yourself, why am I looking at these? Well, the idea is that these have very different differences. <laughs> it's a terrible thing to say uh, for very specific reasons. Uh, again, different models are communicating different pieces to different audience. Your physical as is is going to be closer to your technical people that needs to have the same common vocabulary so that when you discuss logical or conceptual models with your business people, you're able to, in fact, actually uh, participate in a meaningful conversation around this. Uh, and again, remembering in all cases, we're reverse engineering first and then understanding our existing. The only time you don't go through this process is when you're starting a brand new system for a brand new company. And that does happen occasionally, but not on a fairly regular basis. So uh, we're going to uh, do some quick overviews here, and I've got a bit of wind-up material uh, in order to start again. Where we started was uh, back at the top of the hour with an introduction to data modeling, looking at three types of data modeling, plus a couple of characteristics that we looked at them. But to say that a data model is done so that you start to solve a specific 
business problem or answer a specific question uh, in order to do that. I'll give you an example of that coming right up. Uh, conceptual models then are motivated by understanding architectural trade-offs, incorporating strategy in the data modeling and starting the concept of putting together your common vocabulary. Logical, uh, again, trying to get to simplicity. So as you take your original conceptual model, it might be messier than you thought and somebody else who's trained at design work, which is a skill in and of itself that we don't teach anymore, uh, will permit you to uh, uh, simplify the original design, motivate things towards standards and make sure that the business meets strategy in that. And then we get to the physical component, which is to say that we need to understand what's actually happening in our systems. We're documented uh, either before or after very quickly uh, in order to do this. Ideally, it's printed out so that you can use it to build and generate, in this case, physical construction of the solutions and used uh, as maintained as uh, physical solutions uh, on that. So we're headed towards the Q&A part, but I got a couple more things to, to sort of sum up with. There are correct ways to organize data all involve modeling data. So if data modeling is not being done, it is incorrect just by definition uh, on there. Flexibility, adaptability, retrievability, risk reduction, these are all ways of optimizing your design, which is a good reason to take uh, do the transfers that we're speaking of uh, in order to do this. And I give an example with the uh, music uh, database. Techniques include Data integrity, remember when that bridge joined and made it stronger? Uh, data integrity is very much like that. Uh, remembering things like smart codes are bad and dumb codes are good. Uh, we could talk about that in the Q&A part if you wanted a little bit, but uh, just imagine those of you that are older, and I, I have to tell you, I was just back from China, uh, where they have a saying in China that uh, Dama is either uh, gray hair or no hair uh, on that. And uh, I fall into both those categories in some respects. But uh, they certainly understood the uh, concepts uh, around uh, uh, figuring out some of these old ways of doing things. Architectures, again, things are, are just ways that work uh, in order to do this, but don't really amount to much in terms of what we're trying to come up with. If we want world peace, uh, we're never going to get anywhere. So start out by not telling them that you're modeling. Don't invite them to a modeling session. They're subject matter experts, and what you need to do is you need to understand their expertise. They actually do understand the information that you need to have, but you need to communicate them. But don't say we're going to bring you to a modeling session because then they feel pressure. Just start writing some stuff down. Uh, I know that sounds absolutely nuts, but you don't need a immense sketch. Uh, several of the people I've mentioned before are, are very good at going into organizations and coming up with models by just talking to people and seeing what's happening. And because you write some stuff down and then you arrange it. That's how you do your modeling uh, on that. And then you make appropriate connections between your objects. And as you understand those, you can create a few set of data structures that you'd like to have, but not a huge number. Because if you have more data structures, you're going to spend more time transforming between data structures uh, than you are going to be actually producing useful work for people in order to do that. So just keep it light and let people understand this. Mainly keep them focused on a data model's purpose. So if you have questions or you're seeing that you're in a modeling session and people are confused for one reason or another, put down at the top of the page the the, the whiteboard, whatever it is you're working on in here and say, we are in here to understand the formal relationship between soda and customer. I'm making this example up here, but we want to walk out that door with an as is physical and logical model for this relationship. And in this case, it's not terribly sophisticated. It's going to be some variant of what I'm showing you in the upper right hand corner there. Uh, in order to do the uh, soda is given to the customer and the customer selects and pays for the soda. Uh, on there. We can check that against future models and see if we've added features, uh, missing functionality, et cetera, et cetera. But we've formalized these things in order to do this. Here's another one going back to our hospital beds uh, topic here, understanding the characteristics that differ on this. So we want to walk out the door when we can identify the top three characteristics that represent the brand with a logical data model. So we're trying to figure out what are the things we need to incorporate in order to do this. Uh, primary means of tracking a patient could become important in there. That was sort of buried in the details, and we've now surfaced it as a major obstacle, and are going to try and figure something else, like plan B in this case. Uh, our third example here, again, 
what if we had to put the following rule change in place tomorrow? For example, uh, we'll go back into a pandemic. Is job sharing permitted? If the rule is a employee has exactly one position, uh, then that's going to be a problem. Um, that's because the union's going to get on us or whatever we're you know, uh, trying to figure out. And they're just add your own situation. But the key is, can I use this data modeling to confirm the fact that we have a position that we can put multiple employees in uh, in order to do this if we're going to make this presentation to the board? And exactly one or can be filled by zero, one, or many. Oh, well, many is very, very useful. Uh, given that type of a situation here. So just finish up uh, all this as we're headed towards the top of the hour. Goals have to be shared. There's just no other way of doing it. It's a three-way sharing. It's between the business and IT and the systems themselves. Uh, if we don't have any disagreement or refinement going on, it means we have insufficient communication. And we need to go back and look for this. If somebody is just talking uh, about things and, and saying, uh, uh, you know, everybody's sitting there going, yep, it's fine. It's not going to work. All of these exchanges are automated and dependent on highly successful engineering and architecture uh, components. They've got to have a sound foundation in data modeling basics because you need to understand the structures, the capabilities of those components as you build them forward. If you don't understand them, you're building a house of cheese and you don't have a solid foundation on it. But each of these components can be architecturally specified uh, at this level and we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We've got these things already existing. Uh, we're incorporating purpose statements in our models in this case, not trying to specifically uh, just simply define them, but look at it from why are we doing this? It's a problem solving activity as well as a problem definitional activities. And that we are going to incorporate modeling characteristics by doing different modeling challenges to answer different questions. The idea that we're going to have everything modeled, of course, is useless. It's not going to happen. But we can keep as much information as we can and have that information in a way that we can easily build onto it. So the modeling use is much more important than selection of the specific methods. And we're not going to get into arguments uh, about that but instead maintain the models as living documents. And there will be disagreements. Let's dive in and find out what we're trying to do uh, and figure out uh, how they, the, and the models need to be searchable in order to do that. If we can't search them, there's just no point whatsoever. The key is to have utility. And if you have nothing else, just make sure you have a counter on your modeling components because uh, otherwise how will people know what you're in fact actually producing in there? <laughs> Silly things like color and, and clip art uh, can really, really help your organization gain understanding of these things and derive additional value from it. But the value is a three-step process. It's not just deriving value because you've got data. You've got better organizational data. That's wonderful. But you've also got to improve the way people use that data in order to actually help people use that data in supportive strategy. So think back to our iterative design process where things are going to get better and better and better and keep working our way around, improving each additional time we do this. This can only be accomplished by using an iterative approach, focusing on one aspect of a time and applying formalized transformations. Because if we don't have this process of doing this, we are really focusing on the model for the model's sake. And the model is there to communicate, to give us the results of an analysis or some other question that we're asking that should be shared across the top of the puzzle. I want to take just two minutes at the end here and give you a little bit of more information. If you're interested to, to dive further into these topics, there's some wonderful resources uh, that I and other people have made uses of. First one is the Data, data Management Body of Knowledge, DIMBOK, uh, in there. That is uh, the idea that uh, data modeling chapters in there, well, I've done some good justice uh, around that, uh, contain these concepts as practice areas in here that's just part of the overall, what does it mean to do data management? If this is your first time seeing this, uh, please do check it out. Just Google us, you'll find us uh, online. Yeah. In order to do this, I've got a couple of uh, other works that I'm just including in here as a general definition uh, for you. So if you really want to get into it, but uh, also my colleagues, uh, David Hay, 
uh, who wanted to make sure to get in there. Uh, also, I mentioned a book. This one is by Graham Simpson. Really more important on understanding uh, data modeling at a next level down uh, around this. And as I mentioned before, some current uh, modeling topics from Bernard Hallheim uh, as well as Gordon Everest uh, around these topics here. So we're getting back into the top of the hour here again. Extra points off if you go to my website and buy some books uh, around that process. But let's talk about what's coming up. Uh, we've got uh, a couple of things that we're looking forward to. So Shannon, back over to you. And uh, what do we have coming up is uh, metadata and then uh, getting quality right and then enterprise data world coming up. So we're actually getting back together physically in person. Uh, so hopefully we will see everybody there uh, at that point in time and uh, look forward to uh, catching up uh, in person. It's just been great having the DGIQs. I think everybody's really enjoyed get back together. We're certainly looking forward to it too. So give you guys a second to get some Q&A together and uh, say hey to Shanna. Peter, thank you so much for another great presentation as always. And just uh, if you have a question for Peter, feel free to submit it in the Q&A portion of your screen uh, as I'll be reading it from there. And yes, I'm so excited, Peter, that EDW Enterprise Data World is back in person finally. Not digital this this time. It's in Anaheim, um, so you know I, we're talking a lot about going to Disneyland as well, and in addition to going to EDW, and you'll be there, right? So we absolutely. can absolutely. There's just so many ways that this is more powerful in person than it is over the Zoom session. So we, don't get us wrong, guys. We love you on Zoom, but uh, seeing in person is really what what uh, gets the, uh, the the communication going. Oh, I love the networking and meeting everyone in person. Yeah, it's great. Well, um, let's dive in here, Peter. There's some great questions coming in, of course, because we have an amazing community. So here, so if an org has decided to build a business glossary for the enterprise, then should that business glossary be 100% aligned with a conceptual model? For example, HR business glossary much match, must match the HR conceptual data model. Is this a DM box standard? Um, I don't believe there's anything in the DM Bach about that as a standard. Uh, that said, it does make sense that, actually, let's say the converse, it doesn't make sense that the two of these things are not uh, linked up. So whether you need to alias them or otherwise uh, somehow make people understand, your business glossary should be the nouns that people are using in the organization. If somebody calls it a flibbit, then that's what everybody needs to call it. And you need to have some place in your glossary that says flibits are the same as row seven in this particular database or whatever it is that they've got uh, in there. That's the kind of consensus that needs to occur because otherwise we find many times organizations have carefully planned what they want to measure and still ended up measuring the wrong things. And that can be a, a disaster in terms of reporting and other characteristics. Great question though. Thank you for that. Agreed. And I forgot to mention and answer the most commonly asked question, Peter, and people are asking it um, now is that, yes, we I will send a follow-up email by end of day Thursday with links to the slides, the recording, and anything else requested. Somebody requested the transcript, and I got to look at Zoom to see how good their transcript is. Because and if, how much it's going to take us to like scrub it, I know that the Zoom the new Zoom um, AI transcript doesn't ever get data diversity right. It's always diversity, so you know we'll see. <laughs> your AI never hallucinates, right, Shannon? Uh, <laughs> well, I will work to see what I can get for everybody because I know you all love that. So it's been some great chat going on. Um, so diving, continuing on here, uh, a conceptual data model has th have three have relationships from level one data concept entity to level three data concept in the same model. Are her horizontal relationships from different level entities to different level entities show allowed, or relationships must exist at the same level? Very detailed question. Thank you for that. Um, I'm popping back up the Zachman framework because I apply the same rules, if you will. So when you say things like allowed, it, it really depends on the doctrinal pieces. And whatever you do, don't let business people or managers hear you having any of these discussions uh, about it. But the, the best way to think of it is that each of these architectural, I'll just go ahead and drop down to the next one here. There's uh, those three and we've got close up on them. Each of those three can 
have specific relationships to the bottom or lower levels. And there's an architect, the conceptual can be related to the logical and the logic conceptual can also be related to the physical, but I say can. And what you want to do is record the instances where it does occur and where it makes sense, but don't try and get them all in there for the sake of completing them. Remember, each data model is designed to answer a specific business question. Find out what that question is, use your model to answer it, and then go back to doing what you were doing before you got the question on it. Make sure that you keep the answer somewhere where it's accessible so that others won't have to answer the same question twice. Uh, in there. Uh, again, great question. I hope that makes sense. The conceptual components can show up just as they can show up in the Zachman framework, but they do not have to show up. There is no rule or body that's going to come out and, and uh, smack you about if you don't do it the way they want you to do it. Uh, it really makes sense in your organizations, but I would suggest putting in there that they can show up because that means they don't have to show up and you certainly don't have a task that says each of these has to have many of these connected to each of those. I hope that was helpful, but a great question. Thanks. Really good question. And, you know, Peter, with, you know, chat GPT and everything else going on, the big question, you know, coming down the pike, will AI eventually replace data modelers? The answer is no. And the reason for that is because we've got a long way to go before everybody, including the AIs, understand the questions that are at. So I'm gonna jump back to the, the sort of uh, conclusion state that I had here. Let me just pop this back up. Um, the idea is that we've taught people that modeling is something they should do. That's good, but we need to go a little better than just modeling is something that we should do. We should do modeling for the purpose of answering a question, coming up with some sort of a documentation, uh, a design document, something that we can use uh, in one form or another in the organization, something of value. And so the idea is let's find a way to add value. The reason we're locked in this room is because we've never had one of these. Uh, again, forgive my slowness here. I don't have these pre-done because I didn't know what questions y'all were going to ask me. Uh, there we go. It's... Um, yeah, okay. One of these, we didn't, we have, we need one of these for our organization, right? We need a really nice definition. It would just help if we had even that much that everybody in about eight departments that all use this data would be uh, really, really useful uh, in order to do. All right. So we want to come up with one of those. We're just going to lock ourselves in this room until we come up with, and hopefully we've got a good facilitator uh, around that that you've got is, uh, is able to actually find the meaning for these things and come away with it. So these are done for a purpose uh, in order to do that. And you find out what that purpose is and you answer the question and then you store the model in a format so that you can reuse the information of the model and not start from zero the next time that you do this. Again, great question. Thanks for asking that. Indeed. So. Peter, when uh, when reverse engineering is a one person task, or it, when reverse en engineering is this a one person task or a team? If reverse engineering is a team effort, who would be the players involved? Wow, uh, I'm sort of surprised. I, I literally wrote the book on this, and uh, so if you have any trouble finding it out there. Uh, send me a note and I'll send you a PDF version of this. It has the players, it has the, the, the things. All right, so let's, let's talk about reverse engineering. And I think that's really what probably the questioner is asking uh, on this. I popped this slide up three different times uh, during the, the presentation here. We teach our students the wrong context for building out these systems. They are not, for the most part, when they get out there in the real world, going to be building new things. They're going to be working on existing things. You want to know why threads sucks so bad. Now, I'm not saying thread sucks, but it's just not a very good system right now. And the reason is because they are reusing components that were never designed to be uh, used in the way that they're using it. They may get it right. They may be able to engineer over top of it, but uh, it is uh, very definitely the pee in the pod situation there. Uh, the pee on the princess's bed uh, in order to do this. Almost always, you are going to start out by doing some form of reverse or re-engineering. And again, I just love to tell the story that my 
name, my title when I was at the Defense Department was U.S. DOD Reverse Engineering Program Manager. I was in charge of all reverse engineering for the entire Department of Defense, and I had teams doing reverse engineering projects around the globe uh, working on these various systems, and it was a fascinating exercise. We had measures and metrics and all sorts of things uh, done in order to get ready for Y2K, believe it or not. Uh, there was other uh, good rationale as well, but it was easily justifiable under the Y2K piece. Now, the question was, can a reverse engineering be a single activity? It may be as simple as a single activity. You can back your database right up to this. If you know where to go read the Oracle catalog or other types of things and park it to a reverse engineering tool, uh, it'll pull it, suck it, and spit out the physical as-is model. That's your best solution. If you have access to that, some of the systems are smart and will, will report themselves out uh, uh, in order to do this. But uh, uh, that is exactly what you're looking to do is to find out the various components of your system that are there. Then you can start to see how they're organized, how they're organized to support faster, better, or cheaper. Right? Remember, not all three of them at once uh, in order to do this. Now, the, the other part of the question was, are we going to be replaced by AI? The answer is absolutely not. Uh, we still have semantics to deal with, and AI has not done well with semantics uh, up to this point. Uh, semantics is the idea that I give a phrase such as take the building. If I give that phrase to different parts of the defense department, they will do different things with it. If I say take the building to the army, they're going to form a perimeter around it and uh, make sure there's nobody bad inside it. Uh, if I give it to the Navy, they turn out the lights and lock up and leave. And if I give it to the Air Force, they sign a three-year lease with an option to buy. So all of those are interpretable in different ways, and uh, we're going to have very sophisticated uh, AIs before they're able to handle that kind of understanding. So as for data modelers, data analysts, data scientists, I'd say your jobs are pretty safe from AI for a while. In fact, you might actually look and see what are some of the active hallucinations that ChatGPT is inserting into some of the information that it gives. Uh, some of the information it gives is very, very good, and some of it's completely made up, and uh, that doesn't work out so well. There's a, a, a judge in uh, the western part of the country, I think, that's got a, a case in front of him right now where they submitted some uh, briefings with uh, chat GBT submissions in there. Not a, not a pretty sight, Shannon, not a pretty sight. Oh yeah, they lost. <laughs> I so, figured they would. Yeah, the judge said you cannot use chat GPT to, to write legal <laughs> legalese. Um, but Hallucinations we'll are a problem, folks. <laughs> yeah, we'll see how that progresses. But uh, um, so, you know, Peter, this question came in super early and you did cover some of this, absolutely so, but um, I'm gonna ask it just in case there's anything you wanna add in context. So um, again, this came in right, right at the beginning of the webinar, will we also discuss enterprise conceptual information modeling uh, as in uh, an enterprise reference model for understanding the business? And you did talk about some of that, but anything you wanna expand on in, in relation to that question and how it's phrased? Sure. It is a good question. Um, again, I hope that the whole point of this exercise was to give you an idea that it's more trouble to manage data and information separately than it is to manage them together as one asset uh, in there. And so from that perspective, really, if, if an organization says we're going to model our data this way and our information another way, I would suggest that uh, it's probably not going to be a fruitful exercise because there is very little difference uh, between them here. It's the addition of an attribute called request to an item already called data that contains facts and meanings uh, about it. And, and trying to measure the two, trying to manage the two of those things separately is is absolutely crazy. Now, the, I think the questioner though is asking more along the lines. Let me see if I can find that slide uh, where we talked a little bit more about conceptual uh, modeling. Uh, on this. We've done some work over the years uh, that has been very much uh, fun. Um, in other words, how does one actually make use of these models? 
And I found two areas that are really useful. Uh, first one is sort of as a target that somebody says, hey, this is what the industry does. And I'm showing you this because this is actually nothing. It's a, it's a very abstract concept. But people do make these. Uh, and many times you can purchase them. I had one group that had purchased one of these and decided they didn't like it and wanted to get changes to it. And it's like, well, no, no, it's not the way these things work. Uh, these are done by maintained by an, a separate group, and they claim to have at least best practices encapsulated uh, throughout the industry. Uh, so it reminds me, Shannon, one time I was out at the DGIQ. It was a sun, sunny one, so it must have been a June one. And somebody on one of these calls asked me and said specifically, hey, do you know where I could find a data model for a pharmacy? Uh, uh, in this case, a pharmacy uh, cash model. And Len Silverstone literally was walking by the room at that point in time. I grabbed him and he told me what page of his books had that particular data model uh, already set up in it. And it was just a real fun, spontaneous session. I don't know if you remember that or not. But the idea is, again, each of these things can be at the, the uh, enterprise level. And you can say, you know, there are some things that we can say about the enterprise, and we probably should say them. They may involve, for example, a uh, specification of lists on the top row here of the Zachman framework uh, or other types of, of specifications. But you're never going to specify the entire thing perfect for the entire enterprise in all likelihood, unless you are, are limited by size. Uh, around that. And so the best thing that you can hope for from a conceptual level is to, in fact, try to get some things that we'll use. We'll use these vocabulary items and this picture uh, to represent, uh, you know, these concepts for us, for the entire organization. And that makes sense. But where these things go off the rails is that organizations then say, great, we just have to specify everything. And it's like, nope, it probably follows an 80-20 distribution curve. 80% of the value can be gained by modeling 20% of those pieces. Try to keep it focused on that and don't get distracted. And you'll more than likely end up with a, a, a place where people recognize these things are, 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 are useful. Let me make one more point, Shannon, before I toss it back over to you. And that is that many executives don't understand the purpose of these models and things. And I'm keeping it up on the Zachman framework for a very specific reason. Uh, and that is that I had a, a CIO that I worked with in New York City for a number of years, who was a very, very fine individual. And he said, I do not understand what it is you guys in the data world do, but I understand that it is important. And I understand the why of why we do it. So when I go around and I see the models that are produced here in this office by reverse engineering our legacy systems, uh, and they're using it to plan enhancements going forward, that they are useful, that it is a valuable thing that you do. And that out of my organization of 400 people, four of them devoted to this seems like an appropriate amount. Let me know if you need more or less in terms of what's, what's, what's working here. So they also understand or can understand they don't get the nuances of the, the details that we've talked about over the past hour. They can understand the value, the guidance that people get from these things because they are representing the golden version of just the truth about what's actually happening out there. And that the sooner you're able to get good at this process of going from uh, conceptual to logical and perhaps even uh, traversing between the re-engineering components uh, of all of this, sorry, I went to the wrong slide there, uh, the more uh, uh, value that you'll get in your organizations uh, all the way up and down. So uh, let me just pop that back slide up and make sure I reiterate that point as I get ready to toss it back over to you, Shannon. There we go. That's the one I wanted. And uh, the key there is, of course, again, first reverse engineer what works well and what doesn't work. And if it's working well, uh, we want to keep it. And if it's not working well, we probably don't want to keep it uh, in there. So we can take it to that. Uh, anyway, Shannon, back to you. Uh, what's our next Yeah, question yeah, you know, and the about? questioner, you know, expanded on that same question. You know, it's, it, it, is, it is more about conceptual models using other conceptual models because the business doesn't change conceptually. And we have only one enterprise. We don't build applications but have, you know, 1,500 running. Great, great example in, in terms of that. Yeah, the, the key is, again, where does it make sense for this thing to be true? Uh, and that's uh, words of wisdom from Amos Traversky uh, in there. And if you look at it from that perspective, you'll find it's very, very useful. But if you try to 
put it out as a more of a governance kind of thing that's a prescriptive, uh, it's probably not going to be useful. But thank you for the clarification. So Peter, how does data modeling fit into reporting and analysis from a microservices domain-driven design architecture? Yeah, so here's the thing. No matter what flavor of architecture that you're practicing, you're still going to be taking some form of an IPO model. It's an IPO model is an input process output model. And in that context, you're going to be reading something. Something's going to be coming into your system. That's the inputs. Your system is going to do something with those inputs. Well, the things that you're reading and the things that are you're going to do with those inputs are very much at the attribute level. And if you have confusion over what that attribute is, you will be correct producing the correct solution to the wrong problem uh, in there. And that happens enough that it is a, a term of art, uh, if you will. So the key is to make sure that in all cases, you have, relatively speaking, a good, probably even an excellent understanding of what your data requirements are. Because if you do not have that understanding of them, that means they might change. And again, the last thing you want in your build is somebody to say, oh, by the way, one of those fundamental pieces that we were talking about underneath all of this stuff is uh, is uh, changing on us uh, around this. So again, I'm just going to rebuild this real quick, uh, make sure everybody follows on this. Our as is versus our to be, what we'd like to have versus what we're going to have. Our as is should have a one-to-one -one correspondence with things in our existing data set in there. As such, the models will either be valid or invalid. Uh, again, not validated is the, the word that is used on there and the default setting for all of them. And it should be written on all of your models that are in fact invalid uh, uh, in order to do that. And finally, we can break them up into logical, physical, and conceptual uh, around that. I don't know why I always start with the middle one, logical, physical, conceptual. Again, our conceptual model is generally at a high level what is going to be happening. But as several of you have pointed out, it also can include, however, everywhere that's possible, you should implement it using this data structure. And by that, again, remember as few data structures as we possibly can have, the better off we are. Uh, again, that should then be transformed into a plan. So the notebook on the left represents the, what the model in the center is, the how and the physical is the resultant from that. And of course, uh, every modeling transformation can be mapped into this. And that's, uh, to me, much more important than arguing about whether what you're doing is conceptual or logical, what the rules are. Instead, find out what is the business problem you're attempting to solve and use the type of modeling that's appropriate there. Conceptual modeling, if it's implemented as I've described here of, of wherever it's appropriate to use, then by all means uh, can be useful, but it certainly won't be authoritative uh, in there. So again, keep a, those kinds of distinctions in your mind away uh, around that. But I think that'll help, help guide you in terms of that. Indeed, and we've got lots of great questions coming in. We've got about nine minutes left. Let's have a look at in as many as we can here. So Peter, seeing many openings for data modelers, but requiring expert level and SQL to apply, how much SQL skill is really required for a data modeler? Wouldn't you rather have a simple tool that is known by everybody in the world? Uh, I, I say that with full understanding that not everybody in the world does understand it, but certainly understood by a large people in terms of a data manipulation language. So more SQL generally better uh, around that. I, I, I don't urge you to skimp on that understanding how you divide up large sets of things easily from data structure origins is a entirely good complement to learning what you're learning here. And if you don't, eventually what will happen as you're talking to somebody and you're trying to explain to them go, oh, you mean this in SQL? And you'll be like, yeah. And I said, why didn't you just say that in the first place? So yeah, keep keep a focus on SQL. SQL good, thumbs up. I like it. So about when to start with conceptual models? Isn't a new company startup actually the best place to start before technical debt is accumulated from poor architecture? Excuse me, I sneezed on that. But yes, that is exactly the conditions under which conceptual modeling makes sense. But 
make it make sense such that and I'm going to make this very specific to your startup, such that the founders continue to care about it and understand it. So there's the challenge back to you. Yes, absolutely. If, if you're in a situation where you have zero in front of you and there's no reference or standard model that you can go out and rent or purchase uh, on the market to give you some guidance and you've looked all through Len Silverstone's wonderful books and David Hayes data model pattern books and all the rest and can't find any place then then absolutely starting off with a conceptual model makes sense and, and hopefully you'll uh, get some good use out of it uh, in terms of that. Uh, but um, at the same time if you what you're trying to do is write the world's next payroll system I'm not sure you're really going to need a conceptual model. So fair, fair answer, I hope. Thanks, Jenna. Fair answer, indeed. So would the conceptual model be the reference for the business capabilities model, providing the terms to use? Well, it's an actual one way of getting it to work that way. Uh, I had once had a, uh, it was in fact that same CIO uh, that I was telling you all about earlier, uh, who, who said to me, show me what I'm going to need to have prepared, what's going to make the modelers happy. Uh, and of course, you know, we'd all love to have perfect information, but it doesn't work out th that way in the world. Uh, so yeah, I think the, the, the kind of thing that you just described is saying, all right, so we've got these pieces of it. What can we do? And what can we make sense? What, what is going to happen uh, with them? Where are we going to be able to apply each of these concepts? And that is a analyst looking through their toolbox, trying to figure out what is the right tool to use to apply to the business problem. Uh, and, and of all things is much more valuable than somebody who says, I'm gonna try as hard as I can to make this fit into what I understand as logical data modeling uh, around this. Again, I hope that's a good, good answer for you, but it's, a, it's, a, it's very definitely a value judgment thing that you're gonna get into. I love it. So Okay, so we've got time. We've got five more minutes here, Peter. So um, should a conceptual model have too many relationships between people, places, and things, or is there a limit to the number of relationships? Well, actually, the what I just referenced in the previous question is, is a good limiting uh, concept uh, that's in there. If you can make it interesting enough that the founders will still pay attention to it, uh, then it, it's worth it. And if if they're not, uh, if they can't see why they'd want to pay attention to it all, then, then probably not. Uh, the key to it, if you're looking at conceptual modeling, is to make sure that you incorporate strategy, security, privacy, these concepts in early uh, in your design, because they are almost impossible to accurately retrofit. And so the key to conceptual modeling is to say, what are the big things, the things in context that this model is going to have to do? Uh, I was brought to my attention by a, a close friend of mine today that uh, one of the local newspapers has a sign up that says uh, on their website, we're just not going to mess with GDPR. So we just blocked our website from all their GDPR sites. Sorry if that offends you or, or, or bugs you, but it's quite frankly, it's not worth us to invest in that kind of uh, um, nonsense. Uh, interesting uh, concept around all of that. And I can guarantee you that their systems were not designed uh, in order to do that. In fact, they're designed to promote uh, exchange of angry information back and forth, uh, but that's a different different topic entirely. Thanks, Shannon, great, great question. <laughs> Indeed. So, uh, you know, how can you, uh, one more question here, how can you add a, to a data model the time traveling function that is to have a permanent log information about the change of a data value, who did it, when did it, where did it, et cetera. Each instance should have its own control fields or should be a separate instance linked to the instance or entity. Well, of course, that's a question of granularity, is it not? And uh, there are well, examples out there time and time again you do not need to do this uh, and invent your own on this and in fact it's such a, a well-studied area there's research that you can look up and find out uh, what has been helpful in other contexts uh, you know how did it work out if we were clearing the data lake house uh, instead of uh, a special cube that was done there and you know it was, it was fresher data in the lake house but it was uh, faster access on the cube and what was the value of that that uh, freshman which is you know end up fairly nice, neat little little project that you can jump onto. Um, but yeah, it's uh, 
it it really if you've got the luxury to do that and and the ability to do that uh, i'd love to find out more about what you're doing to to to, to help you fine tune that because uh, most organizations don't get to that well good of an understanding to even be able to apply the problem for it uh in there but uh, anyway great great questions today thank you guys so much uh, it's always a pleasure talking to y'all Peter, thank you so much. And thanks to everybody for all the great questions, but I'm afraid we are coming to the end of the presentation today. Again, uh, we hope to see you at Enterprise Data World in Anaheim in September. Um, you can meet Peter and myself in person. Love to meet everybody in person. Shout out to those of you who already are who are registered already. Super Early Bird ends next Friday, a week from this Friday. So, um, and again, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day, uh, Thursday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording for everybody. So thanks, Peter. I hope you all have a great day. Thanks, y'all. And I thank everybody as well. And thank you, Shannon. Have a great day.